Well, welcome, everyone. We're very excited to have you all with us today. Um, of course, on the time and the day when we are on very tight time, I'm having a tiny bit of technical difficulty, but I think it's all squared away now. Perfect. All right. So welcome, everyone. We're really excited to be bringing you today's conversations all about this incredible briefing book that Ties has created to support the work of the STEM learning ecosystems community of practice in accessing the funds and opportunities that the CHIPS Act will bring. We're going to go ahead and put that link in the chat right now, but it is also available on the SLE COP website. Uh, please make sure to share this far and wide. I see some of our friends and colleagues in the chat and some new faces as well. So welcome, everyone. And if you don't mind, as I said before, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from, and what organization you're with. I'm Jeremy Shore, and I'm happy to be with you here today. And if you aren't familiar with the SLE COP, it's an organization made up of about 100 STEM ecosystems operating around the world. STEM ecosystems bring together K-12 education, higher education, business and industry, funders and foundations, out-of-school time providers, all of the key people to create more meaningful STEM learning opportunities for all. Today, we're talking about the CHIPS and Science Act and specifically the briefing book that's being released to help all of you access those funds. So for the last few months, we've been holding these office hours and webinars to share what we know about the CHIPS and Science Act and then to discuss our shared work, needs, and strengths and to begin to think about how we can all respond when the NSF solicitations arrive. As you're probably aware, because you're with us today, we used all of that data you've provided through our RFI in response to the Chips and Science Act to create this briefing book to share with partners of all sectors and all stripes. I think it's important to recognize the Ties team who worked really deeply on this briefing, including Jan Morrison, Alyssa Briggs, XAM Black, Lauren Hofling, and Sadie Norwick. Additionally, this wouldn't have been possible without the contributions of many of our partners listed in the background section of the briefing, including Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona. This briefing book will give a great real-time snapshot of the incredible work going on in the field of STEM education, and it'll also be instructive about the needs and challenges in the field that must be addressed through CHIPS and other funding mechanisms. In the briefing book, we highlight what STEM ecosystems are, what we do well, and our collective strong track records of building and sustaining partnerships to drive action. And in just a moment, we'll be transitioning to the first of two panels designed to discuss the briefing book and the ways that you can use the information contained in it. But before we do, I am uh, really excited to hear from two people that I always call on when I have questions about anything happening in STEM, or, or frankly, Jan, you know this, anything happening in anything. Uh, Jan Morrison, CEO and founder of Ties, and James Brown, the executive director of the STEM Ed Coalition. Jan, can you give us a, a little bit of an overview of how the STEM ecosystems were integrated into the Chips and Science Act and what actions we've taken so far? Well, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I think that uh, the word is empowerment. Uh, we talk about it, ecosystems, we always talk about, um, we talk about collaboration and that that's an important piece. But in, in the rhetoric, we have always said, whether you're in the STEM ecosystem community of practice or you're in the greater STEM community at large, we have always said that it matters that we're forging the future. When we saw after the town hall, we saw the response um, um, in, this, uh, in this past year to a new administration, to the growth from the past administrations and the opportunity to enable voice. What we also saw was the opportunity to be part of the legislation itself. When America competes um, this year, um, in this past year was crafted, it gave an opportunity for us to think about the role of ecosystems, not just as collaborators, but as, a, as a, a group to empower and forge the future, to make those connections between education and workforce, and then again to economic development. That at, in that conversation, um, Senator Kelly's group, and, um, and I think we should call out Catherine, his legislative assistant, who is absolutely awesome, um, crafted language that would enable that. And as things do in the progress of in policy, they made their way through one committee after another, after iteration. And in the final, in the final moment, um, what came was the fact that the, the America Competes would be the CHIPS Act and science, and that the National Science Foundation would be reorganized, and many things would happen through that clearly as well an acknowledgement of the power of collaboration to empowerment of STEM ecosystems, which is in the act itself. 
So we all, we all wrote, all of us here today, all of you, in one way or another, actually added your voice to what is po was possible and is possible. But I think it's critically different right now, Jeremy, than it has been. We have now, instead of just talked about empowering our country and our communities um, to, to forge that future, we've actually done it together. And, and whether or not um, we have competed, and all of us have competed in NSF grants and across um, the Department of Defense grants and grants with private philanthropy and so on, what we have always really treasured is, the, is our ability to come together because we have a shared mission. So that's where we are really. And that's a little bit of the history. And I think that's what sets us up for an amazing next few years. Jim, what are, I know there's, there's a, a lot that happened in order to get to this point, but there's, there's a lot left to do. What are kind of our, our next steps as we move forward with this work? Is that, Jeremy, is that for me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, our next steps are really to absolutely be knowledgeable. Um, in this knowledge, it's very important for us to have a depth of understanding of what the CHIPS Act and, and other legislation has as an offer to us. This is not what we do for a living. We, all of us do other things in STEM, but for this moment, that kind of knowledge is power. That's the first. The second is to look around to your right and left and see who is not around the table, who ought to be there, where in workforce, where does community college come in, where are our great local um, industries and businesses, because we've worked very hard and so if they are not, multinationals are all over this, but where is that small small mom and pop shop that lives in Northeast Ohio that produces something for the aerospace community in which they cannot find the right workforce. Those folks need to be part of this. This is the next, the next steps. The, the other piece is if we walk the same path, we're gonna get the same thing. So let's not do that. Let's talk about when we convene and when we speak together, putting together agendas that not only highlight where our feet are and where the foundations are, but where we can provide an equity and equity agenda. And not just in rhetoric, but what does it really mean to make that work? And being intentional about inclusion. Our Department of Education is talking about belonging. That is at least a term to be used. That is not the final term. The final term is for our children, uh, all, all of our children, all of our families to, to be leading the lives that they choose to and having the kind, of, uh, um, the kind of competencies in which they can. And that's more than rhetoric. That has to be demonstrated so we can see it and say, that's what my community needs. And Omaha might, Omaha might have it and Atlanta may not. So how do we get it from Omaha to Atlanta? So that's also understanding our place um, in the geography of our own country. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, we also have with us today, as I mentioned, James Brown, our friend James Brown. James, we know that we got really incredible support, not only from Senator Mark Kelly, but also from Senator Jerry Moran, who I neglected to mention a minute ago. But what more can you tell us about the Chips and Science Act and how STEM ecosystems will continue to play a role in addressing our nation's STEM needs? Thank you, Jeremy. So uh, Jan, Jan talked about a couple of key concepts, you know, empowerment being one of them. One of the other terms I'd put on the table is capacity building. You know, the reason why there was a bipartisan, you know, group of senators who supported this was because they bought into the idea of building capacity to improve STEM education locally and building it upon, you know, organic community organizations. And so whether we call them ecosystems or networks or coalitions or university centers, there's this fabric of organizations out there in the communities that that this legislation has as a goal to help grow. And so in terms of what you'll see next, you know, we're 10 days out from the midterm congressional elections. As soon as that settles itself out, the Congress is going to turn to an end of the year funding bill. And whether that's, you know, a temporary measure or a long term measure, there's an effort to make sure parts of this bill that aren't yet funded are funded. So that's one thing to keep your eye on. The CHIPS Act already has an implementing office at the Department of Commerce. So they've set up a separate part of government just to implement this bill out of the Secretary of Commerce's office. 
And in January, you're going to start to see other aspects of this rollout besides the 50 plus billion dollars for semiconductor manufacturing. So, you know, you also have a new director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy that's on the ground and trying to roll out this piece of legislation. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, for the Biden administration, the Chips and Science Act is really like the cornerstone of their science and technology agenda. And it's built around this concept from top to bottom at NSF and other agencies of building capacity, you know, not just in education, but in R&D and in other facets that the NSF supports. And one of the things I think is so powerful about, you know, this, this gathering and this group of people and the product we put together in this briefing book is it's showing there's, there's not only enthusiasm in this community, but there's a lot of capability for helping to solve challenges in the STEM education space as NSF shifts into a, a mode of supporting more capacity and not just research around STEM education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown, for your, your always in, uh, insightful comments. Uh, we're really lucky to have you as somebody that we can access as we go through all of this work. All right, well, without further ado, because we have a very packed day today, I'm very proud to welcome Jeff Weld back for us to learn from. Jeff is the executive director of the Iowa Governor's STEM Advisory Council, post he's occupied since 2011. Additionally, Jeff provides STEM education policy and programming advice to regional, state, national, and international organizations, including the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where he led the production of America's Strategic Plan for STEM Education, a five-year strategic plan published in late 2018. He's on extended leave from a faculty position in the Department of Biology at the University of Northern Iowa. Jeff, welcome. Uh, we're so happy to have you with us today. Can you please introduce your panelists? Also, everyone listening, please note that we will link to all the speakers' full bios with the recording of today's webinar. Jeff? Hey, thanks so much, Jeremy, for the introduction and the invitation. I am so excited to uh, introduce and facilitate a conversation with four leading STEM thinkers on the future of STEM education particularly here in the United States. So uh, let me introduce them to you and then we'll get uh, ready to let the wisdom flow. First is Tiffany C. Taylor. Tiffany is the Chief People and Impact Officer at GSV Ventures, investors in education technology leaders positioned to achieve disproportionate gains. She previously served as Executive Director of Teach for America Detroit. Welcome, Tiffany. Hi there. Amber Hamilton is Chief External Communications Officer for 100K in 10, an organization committed to solving one of our country's most pressing challenges, giving every kid a great STEM education. She previously oversaw fundraising for regional hubs at One Goal, a national organization focused on helping historically marginalized students identify, navigate, and complete post-secondary pathways. Welcome, Amber. Leanne Taylor Knight serves as Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer for the DeBruce Foundation in Kansas City, devoted to helping individuals unlock their potential and find career pathways. She's also served as a K-12 Assistant Superintendent, particularly interested in data-driven educational research to inform practice and policy. Welcome, Leanne. Hello, everyone. And finally, Laura Overdeck is the chair of the Overdeck Family Foundation, whose mission is to measurably enhance education inside and outside the classroom. She's also founder of Bedtime Math, a nonprofit organization focused on mathematics education for young children. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. And thanks for the prop, Jeremy. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, and for offering your thoughts in advance on the, on the nation's STEM education trajectory. Let's open this up to a chat, beginning with this prompt. I think everybody will share this sentiment. America's STEM education is been a, by now a well-documented success, at least in pockets in many schools and communities uh, across the country and around the world. Um, yet not everyone is engaged, far from it. What stakeholders do we still need at the table and how do we bring them on? Who would like to crack the ice? Feel free, Amber can start. Um, so I think one of the key stakeholders missing at the table are the young people that we seek to affect, right? Um, it's something that we recognized ourselves after preparing 100,000 new STEM teachers to the field. And as we were trying to decide what our next goal was going to be, we realized we, we didn't want to take a call from up above. We really wanted to make sure it was grounded in young people, what they experienced in K through 12 STEM learning environments and what they need. To, to move them forward. And 
interestingly enough, one of the things that was critical that we heard from them was that belonging matters so much um, in their STEM, and STEM learning environment. So I think that's one group. And if I, I may, yeah. I'm so sorry, but I, it's a two part question. I'm going to hold everybody's feet to the fire. Identify who's not at the table and what ideas do you have for bringing them on, if you don't mind, Amber? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think um, we should bring them to the table. We should actually invite young people to share their stories, to, um, to, to, to tell us what it is that they are looking for. One of the ways that we did that was partnering with organizations across the country who have more direct access and inviting them to respond to a very open-ended prompt. We weren't asking them to, we weren't leading them in a direction. And it was simply, tell us about an experience you had in K through 12 STEM education. Right. So we heard many things where people were, um, had really strong and positive experiences and some that were really quite negative, which I'm sure, you know, many of us probably have also experienced. Indeed, thank you. Yeah, Amber, this I, I love the asking the open ended question and leaning into those youth voices. I would also like to just lift up um, in Kansas City, the KC STEM Alliance and the KC ecosystem did a closing the gap and a beyond the gap in terms of um, racial and gender representation in STEM careers. And these reports represent the lived experiences included of parents. So in addition to the young adults um, who are the audience, really their parents. And I heard from one of the parents even this morning at another panel, um, just how impactful it was for her to even be asked and to be able to be at the table with business leaders and others in higher education and K-12 education to be a part of that. And knowing that her voice was really heard. And then there's a report with some action steps and some real things that we're going to dedicate to. But I, I invite all of you to check this out because this is a good way not only to learn about what should we be doing, but also how to include those lived experiences. Yeah, I, you know, I, I know, Jeff, you're, you're, you're hoping for a little bit of dissent, but I couldn't agree more with uh, Amber and, and Leanne, because I think part of my thought as I heard your question is, it's not simply about what stakeholders are missing, but we need to ask ourselves a question. What is the lived experience of stakeholders who are at the table? There are some organizations and some ecosystems that have already brought parents and students to the table, but they don't you know, experience those spaces um, and they don't feel as if they are valued. We aren't actually engaging them in ways that allow us to demonstrate our value of their voices, our value of the commitment to collective action. So we're not co-designing solutions. We're not giving them the ability to weigh in and make decisions on, on, on policies and practices that impact their schools and their communities. And so I think to your question on like, what do we need to do to ensure that they are engaged? I think we need to like hold up the mirror and ask ourselves a question is, how are we truly engaging with the folks that are at the table before we seek to include others at the table um, as well? Right on. Thank you. Laura? Well, I agree with everything that's been said, and I wanted to add another angle, which is um, in these ecosystems, the K-12 system is obviously a key linchpin of that. And to really get this going, you need your teachers to be comfortable with STEM. And I come from the elementary math world, and I happen to know, and it's has been discussed a lot in the press, that um, elementary school teachers, a lot of them are very anxious about math. We have witnessed at Bedtime Math that we'll be doing PD to show teachers techniques to do with kids. And we can see that the teachers right there are finally learning it, which is great. But how were they left with no support to that point? We also know of a school, like as an example, in Southern Jersey, where they um, the teachers don't teach any science all year. They wait to get the Princeton University student teachers who are going to come in and have them do all the science. Like we see this a lot. And so I would call on teacher prep programs to be more involved in um, these ecosystems and figuring out ways to give what I would call PD with dignity to help mm -hmm. teachers who are nervous about math, engineering, and science to get more comfortable. Because if you're going to have a teacher talk to students and let them know what other opportunities there are in the ecosystem, they have to feel comfortable. They have to feel playful mm -hmm. and, um, and inspired. And the way you do that is make sure they're, they're totally comfortable. And they have to feel valued. Mm -hmm. So another strategy is you should pay them for their time. 
and their experience that they are sharing with you. So with our youth, our Debris Career Corps, we pay them for their time as a part of our work with the lived, with the parents, with those coming. We need to pay them for their time. We value that and we need to show that in that regard. And I would say just just on this point, my hope is that we would also create an opportunity for those teachers in that professional development to have engagements with emerging technologists, with entrepreneurs, with data scientists, so that they can actually not simply receive the knowledge, but that they can step into that partnership as co-creators and that they can design the curriculum, the platforms, the programs, the services that ensure that we are not contributing to an opportunity gap or just creating a, a, a digital use divide. And so I, I would hope Hope that we will be able to do both in that instance when we're uh, engaging our, our educators um, at every level of the systems, teachers, instructional coaches, principal superintendents, uh, what have you. I love the strand, uh, the strand of conversation. I want to touch on a couple of points you've made. Laura, pre-service is getting a lot of pings in the chat box. I think that's a subject of near and dear to a lot of a lot of us in STEM, where I think traditionally, historically, I think the STEM leadership on this panel would agree. We've too often gone around to colleges and certainly gone around teacher preparatory colleges in particular, uh, direct service providers working with K-12 teachers and, and children. And so circling back to engage the faculty, having been a teacher preparer myself and many of my close friends in that business, uh, ideas for how we reach the uh, kind of the STEM cells of the organization, those who are producing the change agents. Well, you know, when you look at this is a tricky topic too, because we're in a, a moment now where we're really worried about teacher shortages and we're not just worried, we're having them. Um, and so having a moment where you say, wait a minute, we got to raise the bar on all the teachers, it's tricky. But I think it's important because long-term that's how this profession gets more yeah. um, respect. Um, I, I totally agree with the previous point about, about um, from Leanne about paying teachers more. Um, they do some of our most important work. And um, I believe that, you know, anybody who wants to be a teacher, let them step up, but then let's give them the support to make right. sure they learn the content and don't leave school and get licensed without um, being solid on their footing, because that helps everybody. Here, here. And before we move on to the next prompt, I want to drill into something that Tiffany and Leanne mentioned. Engagement, Tiffany, it's not enough to be at the table, but let's engage stakeholders purposefully when they're at the table. Leanne, you talked about the KC STEM Alliance. Nobody does it better than Martha McCabe. Can you give us a quick uh, example of something that Martha and the crew there in Kansas City have executed to purposefully engage parents or children? Yeah, 100%. Again, in addition to these reports, um, they're actually starting right now a youth voice group that will be a core that they will meet with virtually, but there will be virtual interns, right? And that's what it's like. We have to pay everyone who's involved in this and are, are a part of it. And so it's going to offer a win-win for those uh, young adults to have their voice at the table, but also to get to, as you were just saying, being in the room with the others who are in the influential zone and being a part of that influential zone. So I'm really excited about Chrissy Chandler's leading that up at KC STEM Alliance. So just, just watch what happens with that because she's going to set the world on fire as that happens. You bet we will. Thank you. So these are a, a fantastic conversation about who's not with us at this time and how to more deeply engage. Let's go big picture now. STEM ought to be changing the world. And in, in small microcosmic ways, we are changing the world. But the world writ large, there's a transformative effect of STEM education. I know we agree. How can STEM innovations like what we've ushered in through the decade plus that we've all been working on STEM, school business partnerships, work-based or career-linked learning, et cetera, how do we enculturate these innovations into the bedrock and the foundation and the scaffold of STEM education across America and education at large, the history class, the foreign language class, uh, uh, et cetera? Who would like to take that one on? I'm happy to jump in. I think that getting kids to see innovators and career people up close and be able to ask questions is just huge. Liberty Science Center here in New Jersey, which is part of our Liberty um, ecosystem, for 20 years, they've been doing a program called Live From. It is live surgery, brain surgery, yeah. kidney transplants. Yeah. These surgeons do the work and classrooms come in and watch on camera. They can 
talk to the surgeon while they're operating on someone's brain. And we have heard of cases of kids, including for some really tough schools, who've gone on and become doctors after mm. going to this program. I mean, it is epic. And I think that um, middle school in particular seems like a real stepchild in our system. I think every middle school should kick off sixth grade with a video showing, you know, footage like that or showing an Advil and then showing a chemist with test tubes and saying that mm. Advil you took yesterday, mm -hmm. chemists made that. You could be that person and that's what you're going to start learning in middle school. Mm. Here's an, a surgeon, that's biology. You're going to learn how your own body works. I feel like there's just a real opportunity to um, get kids more engaged as they get older instead of what we have right now, which is often that they get less engaged. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was gonna say, I, I agree with that so much. I was at um, a conference last week and I think one other bridge to, to making sure that people see and like have that connection in their school is making sure that there are also opportunities where they make the connection to things happening in their daily lives. So I was talking to a woman who is working on a soap opera that's supposed to like bring STEM into the classroom and help families, particularly Latinx families see how um, STEM is in their everyday lives already. And so an example of that is my dad actually is a construction worker. So he works in math every day. And like people not making, people not even like parents making the connection to how that's a STEM related field mm -hmm. and how meaningful and powerful that can be in helping people just see a bigger world and where they fit into it. So I think that's so right. And that piece around like relevance in our everyday lives is really meaningful too. Yeah. And when I when I hear Amber say that I, the, the word that comes to mind is advocacy. Right. And what 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 can we do to empower, engage and cultivate advocates, particularly amongst our parents and our, our, our educators so that they understand how emerging technology is used, how it's developing, how it impacts their everyday life, but also how they can use their voice to advance opportunities, policies and practices for our students. Um, I think that's one of the most powerful levers that we could use in this moment in time to advance um, the, the, the movement forward. Yeah, and I think the three of you set me up perfectly to say what I was going to lean into, which is um, our young adults need to see that they are ready. They are already working on the skills that are in these jobs, right? And so that's where at the DeBruce Foundation, what we really care about is expanding those career pathways and what they will consider. So the sooner that they can see what they do well and what they like to do, we call them the agilities. Um, and they, they can then see like, oh, and here are the careers here are how these agilities are used in these careers. I can grow and develop these and students need to know that they already bring value in this space and that develop that self-worth and that confidence. And so it's a combination of those, of those experiences that we're talking about, as well as knowing that about yourself and knowing like you're already taking steps towards that and getting them those kinds of experiences. I agree to middle school um, and high school. It's really important to go ahead and start in middle school and start having them you know, begin to experience this and know that they have choices and they bring some value into that. So what has to happen starting tomorrow at the scale level of systemic change across a district, across a state or region, across the country for this common sense solution, advocacy. Tiffany, you mentioned preparing educators and parents to be advocates. Laura, I, I hear showcases of innovation jobs that are inspiring, careers that make kids go, wow, these are all very common sense. And, and you would think we could snap the finger and voila, this is implemented and integrated at the middle school level, especially across America. Why isn't it? What would we have to do to make it so? Well, you know, being a math person, I think in numbers, and I think that people don't stop and consider that um, kids spend way more time outside school awake than in it. We live about 8,800 hours in a year. Kids are awake for about 5,000 of it, 6,000. They're in school for only 1,200 um, when you really add it up. Yeah. So they're spending like four fifths of their time <laughs> outside the school. And that time can be used really well or can really be lost. And I think just sharing those numbers with parents and saying, you know, all the other parts of their environment and their life have to knit together with school for learning to really be a continuous life experience for kids. Um, just waking people up to that because that's how you get parents to step up and also you know, be part of these ecosystems. Thank you. Tiffany, you mentioned advocacy. 
teachers and parents, how do we prepare them to play that role at scale? Yes, I, I'd like to just just double down on what Laura also said, because I, I truly believe that one of the first steps we have to take is just cultivating um, a, a strong like commitment towards a lifelong learning, because as she said, that this is this isn't just about making sure our, our pre-K learners or our students um, in K-12 are, are, are receiving quality education. It's really about our ability to say that we are really helping reinforce and strengthen the foundation because they will be learning and engaging um, throughout their life. And so I, I I just I can't uh, agree more uh, with 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 Laura. I think as it relates to um, advocacy for our educators and for our parents, it goes back to what Jan said in the in her opening remarks: is that we have to 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 spend time and resources and energy building a knowledge base, right? Creating access for folks to understand why does this work even matter? How will it in, how how is it going to impact their students or the the parents or community members at large? Ability to contribute in the future, right? To, to be relevant, to feel as if they have the, 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 the space, the, the, the platform to use their voice, to use their gifts, to use their talents in dynamic ways when AI essentially is, is, is like water or electricity, right? When it's not this theoretical um, um, thing that they're trying to wrestle with. So my, 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 my aim is that I would hope for that we would lead with building knowledge in those, in those two groups, with those two groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, Amber, last thoughts on the how? Well, I'll amplify something that Judd has actually placed in the chat, was I, which I think intergenerational learning and starting with the caregivers, you know, and our young important. And it lines up really with this beyond the gap. Um, one of the findings here was to think collectively and be real about the tough stuff. Yeah. And so you cannot advocate if you don't understand and talk about the things that are complex and that are tough, and we cannot shy away from that. So we need to have the enthusiasm for it. And that actually starts to intergenerationally and all of us being in it together to learn and understand from one another so that we can serve and lead in this space. Here, here. Jeff, we've only got about two or three more minutes for this panel. There are a couple of questions from the audience, if, if uh, all of you are open to those. Yeah, Amber, did you have a thought you wanted to bring forth before we go there? The only thing I was going to say is the thing that we found really valuable as our organization is making sure that we're focusing on the highest leverage opportunities for change. And so really understanding what are the, the root causes that... Um, we are most able to impact and affect. And so we actually like created a map of the problem space in STEM education, talked to thousands of people, narrowed it down to a hundred um, different problems and then started to group them and realized there are actually seven big focus areas that will have the greatest, um, greatest impact on the field um, and the experience of young people. So I know there are like so many different threads that we could be working on, but I think the more we can all collectively come together around these large issues and understand what the root is behind them, that that will um, make a big difference. Thank you so much. So heavily, closely related to uh, one of the questions posted in the chat. And Jeremy, I defer to you. I haven't scanned them well. I see one question that's uh, particularly uh, drilling into the culture shift around parents and their children aspiring towards, say, a community college level skilled technical trade career and the, the cultural currents sometimes against that. How do we change that culture so that children and especially their parents and communities and their holiday newsletter, et cetera, embrace whatever trajectory, especially the high demand, high need trajectories that are often uh, credentials and, and skilled technical degrees at a community college are, are fashionable and important. We, we have a there's a number of questions. We're not going to have time for all of them as we frequently do. Uh, but everyone who's listening today, just so you're aware, we are going to give all of these questions to the panelists and let them answer kind of asynchronously. And we'll include those answers in the follow up email that you get at the end of the week. Uh, but final thoughts, panel, um, to, to what uh, Jeff was just talking about. How do we how do we shift this this cultural mindset uh, in order to support these uh, th these critical STEM competencies? I think one of the things that that immediately comes to mind is that so oftentimes we say we need to shift this this cultural mindset, but oftentimes the the conversations about 
alternate pathways outside of college. We're having those in our rural communities. We're having those with black and brown students. We're not having those conversations with all. And so I think one concrete action that we can take is to ensure that we are truly oriented, that there are multiple pathways that all students can pursue. And when parents and students come to realize that this is not simply a conversation that you're having with me because you don't believe in my potential that you that or that you're 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 looking at my zip code or you're looking at my skin color or you're looking at my gender i think that's one meaningful step that we can take to begin to shift some of the the mindsets and preconceived notions about what alternative pathways uh, could be and who they could and should be for yeah eradicate and advisor encouraged- bias And I would encourage people to check out Dr. Michelle Weiss's book, which is on long life learning. And she actually brings some serious strategies around this and how we are going to have to think differently because we're going to continue to learn across our lifetime. So it's not just a one and done. Um, There are going to be so many times that we're going to cycle back through education and all kinds of credentials and all kinds of opportunities are going to be really important for to be offered to individuals and for individuals to be able to take um, the opportunity to engage with. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, panel. Never enough time for these things. Uh, Everyone who's listening, please also know that the panelists will be around for the rest of the session and they will engage with you in the chat. Um, uh, Up next, if Jeff Weld wasn't enough to make this a worthwhile conversation, we're also joined by our friend and colleague, Reginald McGregor. Reginald is Vice President of Government Affairs, Rolls-Royce North America, and Chair of the SLECOP Strategic Advisory Council. Reginald has over 25 years of professional experience in engineering and operations in the pharmaceutical, food service, and aerospace industries. He's an advocate for early childhood and STEM education, and one of my favorite people. Reginald, welcome. Who's uh, joining you today for your conversation? Thank you so much, Jeremy. Hey, that's that's too long of an intro. Let's just get down to it. So my name is Reginald. I'm a, I work in industry, and I am joined by some wonderful colleagues, and we're going to have a beautiful conversation. First, we'll have Jennifer, and it's a, informal. So we have Jennifer from RTI International. We're going to have Eaton, who's from the Ed Development Center. We're going to have Emily from Next Flex, and we're going to have Natalie, who sits on our Strategic Advisory Council, uh, from Qualcomm. So, so it's informal, but we are going to, and Jeff and to his panelists, hey guys, thank you for setting us up here for a good conversation because at the end of the day, when we think about this CHIP Act, so what? What does that mean? Just what does that mean to me? What does that mean to people? Just what does it mean? First, let's think about the whole meaning of the CHIP Act, right? You gotta, you gotta, you, you have to really think about people who get created with acronyms. So CHIP, creating helpful incentives to make sure we produce semiconductors in the United States. Economics, everything come down to our economics. And as we talk about our economics, I want to hear from you all as we talk about the impact, economic impact with the act, the what, and then with our audience, let's talk about the the ecosystem impact, the who. So informal we just sitting around the table talking and everybody please on mic and we're just going to start here so now since uh natalie's at qualcomm who is very instrumental in chips <laughs> microchips now why don't you start talking to us about this whole chip act and the economic impact for all of us Absolutely. Thanks, Reginald. And thanks to Jan and Tyves for having me here today. So this conversation is really timely. It was actually just at Houston Community College yesterday, where um, Congressman McCall, who was one of the original authors of the Chips and Science Act, was present, and also Dr. Erwin Gianchandi, who is the new TIP director for NSF, talking about this very topic. So To answer your question, I think the economic opportunity that we have comes down to a few different things. We're looking at, in the short term, bringing a bunch of jobs back to the US, specifically in the semiconductor industry. But I think also long term, you know, the potential for also that innovation and R&D to come back to the US as well. And so thinking about the jobs that'll create the innovation that will drive the the competitiveness for the US. And I love what both the Congressman and Dr. Gianchani said yesterday is looking at this as a 
once in a generation lifetime opportunity for us to really be mindful about how we go about collaborating, thinking about, you know, not just industry, but our STEM ecosystem partners. How do we work together to really make sure that we're driving that economic development for the U.S.? So I see both the short term and the long term impacts being really important there. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany, I would add, I think when you started talking about the collaboration and talking with each other, that really is going to be at the foundation of the success of this act. It has the greatest potential for building economies, local economies, uh, state level economies that are resilient, that are innovative, and that respond to not only the needs, the financial and business needs of this world, but the needs of the communities and people who are um, where, where the ecosystems are all located. And it does require a bit of a paradigm shift, right? Many, many of our um, STEM communities and our businesses are not used to collaboration in this way. So how well we build that into the fabric of these ecosystems will determine, I think, how we are able to realize the potential of this act. When Eden talks about some great adjectives you use there, resilient and innovative economies, one of the things that comes to mind as a big opportunity for us all to grasp is just this immense untapped talent pool that we have of young people who don't currently have meaningful opportunities to engage in STEM. This could be students with disabilities, female students in some cases. We have so much to gain from engaging them in STEM education and then in the STEM workforce, and quite frankly, so much to lose if we don't. And can I add on to that? Um, I was going to say that, uh, you know, one of the reasons the CHIPS Act has received so much funding, as we all know, is because it is an issue of national security. Um, and there is a huge amount of funding for education and workforce development, relatively speaking, involved as well, because what creates fundamental progress in science and technology is humans, right? Human ingenuity. And so the issue of cultivating a national STEM talent pool is actually one literally of national security. Um, so I think that one of the most important things to look at when we talk about things like this is what holds people back from participating in the STEM workforce. And we see a lot about this uh, in education, but if you look at the data, one of the biggest factors is poverty. Um, and so I think this brings us back to why STEM ecosystems are so important, because you can almost predict whether or not a student is likely to join the STEM workforce, especially at a level with an advanced degree, before they are born. That's heartbreaking and wrong. So if we want to actually increase participation in the STEM workforce, we need our educational partners to be working with our community-based organizations that are addressing poverty because you can't learn math when you're cold, when you're hungry, when you feel unsafe, when you don't have electricity at night, those kind of things. So this ecosystem approach that brings all of the critical players together and acknowledges um, the full range of reasons that people are not able to pursue these pathways is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Emily, one of the things that comes to mind, though, is, as you're talking, is that we also have to, I think, transform a little bit what we think of as knowledge and experience and what uh, we mean when we're talking about who is learning and who's learning from whom. When we have educators and STEM professionals who are experts and come to their classrooms and look at students, particularly students who are poor, students who are of color, as not bringing rich experience and, and wealth and knowledge with them, that's a problem. And, you know, I think about um, several years ago, I was listening to a radio show, and on this show was a story about this uh, very, fairly old woman who was really uh, concerned about climate change, and she was talking to scientists in the automotive industry, oddly enough, and they were talking about how the emissions in the first minute after the car is running, right, those emissions are the worst 
And because the systems haven't warmed up enough in the car to manage them effectively. And she simply said, why aren't you capturing those emissions then and putting them back through when, um, when the systems are ready? I don't know anything about automotive, but I do know from that story that that transformed how those STEM professionals started thinking about that problem. Our youth do that. Anybody who is involved in problems that they're concerned about are able to contribute by showing different perspectives. Panelists, say hey, we make some good points here. We know some of the barriers that keep individuals from entering into this workforce. We also know some things that need the people has to be at the table in order to make those individuals feel like they belong. It's just not a matter of, hey, here's what STEM is, but how do you make those individuals belong as well? Which leads us to our who, the ecosystems. So as we think about the different barriers, first of all, let's think about some of the opportunities. Here we have $50 billion coming into our, uh, I call our economic system to make changes for the way we live, the way we teach, the way we collaborate, all the above. And that's gonna trickle down to those individuals who are part of our ecosystems. Talk to me about the impact that our ecosystem should take advantage of to increase the opportunities for individuals for this unknown or unseen talent force that we do need will be seen. Jennifer? Sure, thanks, Reginald. So when we think of the term pathways, I think we sometimes think in a little bit more of a narrow way. So we think about maybe a particular program of study a high school stud student does that leads them to a certain certificate program at a community college. I think with this funding, ecosystems can really think big and think about pathways as starting in elementary school or even younger than that. What experiences are we giving younger students that spark their interest in STEM? And then how do we foster that and make sure that we don't lose that love, we don't lose that interest as they go through high school into community college. And that involves both in-school and out-of-school opportunities. That involves giving kids hands-on opportunities within the workforce so they can see what they'll actually be doing. And that's where ecosystems are uniquely positioned because those people are there, they're at the table, and they can work together on growing that sort of STEM passion as the kids age. Yeah, I might chime in from an industry perspective. You know, I think a lot about access and awareness. And I think the opportunity for industry partners is a couple of different things. Obviously, that hands-on experience, whether that be through apprenticeships, internships, I think is really key. Um, I also think that um, you know, using our workforce and our employee network groups to really put employees of color in those communities so that students can really see people that look like them, speak like them, so they really can make that connection that this is a viable STEM pathway for me, I think is really key. So I think for companies, I would encourage, you know, others to really, you know, leverage their employee base, make sure they're getting out into those communities that don't necessarily have access to make sure that kids and students really can see themselves having a place in a STEM pathway or career. Mm -hmm. I would add, I co-lead a NSF Includes Alliance called STEM Opportunities in Prison Settings. And we work with individuals um, who were, uh, who didn't have these opportunities, who were excluded. And th that impacts people's lives not just economically, how they view themselves, what they what they come to see as as possible. And these are individuals who, over time, the system has not worked for them. I have never met a person who went to prison that wasn't actively had actively experienced trauma and any number of failures prior to um, failures of the systems prior to going. And as you work with people who have lived these life experiences that are um, what you were just talking about, for example, and I'll tell you that they, their knowledge of the problems are so much richer and deeper than ours. And this connects back to that question of whose knowledge matters. They are able to ask different questions about the problems. They are able to bring different methods and approaches of inquiry. They are able 
to offer dis different solutions, particularly when they're looked at as capable individuals. And that in that notion of belonging, then these individuals, people in prison who represent all population in, in this country, white, black, underrepresented people with disabilities, people who are um, living in poverty, they are everybody um, in this country, um, there is a person like them who is in prison. And um, that really is a needs to be a resource because they have experience we will never understand about the problems in this country and ch challenges we face. Absolutely. Emily. Yeah, I wanted to um, add on to something Natalia was saying about sort of, uh, and a lot of people have said about the um, importance of like actually seeing uh, technologies and things like that so that students can appreciate those pathways and uh, become interested in them. And one thing that we've noticed um, at NextLex, we run an engagement program for K-12 students and we frequently take them to industry partners where they get to see what careers in STEM look like. And one thing that I've noticed that really makes students light up is not just seeing like the individual activity that someone's doing, designing a robot or, you know, assembling something, but understanding how that product is going to go out and change the world, that's absolutely key because a lot of times those um, industry tours are sort of like super focused on something, some minor part of something. And um, for instance, we had a young woman who wanted to go pre-med, uh, go on a tour to an industry partner and she saw how medical devices were created. And she said to me afterwards, oh, I was really interested in pre-med, but now I think I'm interested in engineering medical devices because I realized I can help a lot more people if I invent something that, you know, is then taken to hospitals across the country than as one doctor. Um, and I thought watching that sort of realization come across was very interesting and made the sector mean a lot more to her in some ways. Thank you. T panelists, as you think about the one nugget you want to leave with our audience, say, uh, just real quickly, we're talking about skills here as we talk about how do we stand up this industry. And a lot of times we get stuck on STEM streams, all the acronyms, and really we're just talking about skill sets. And we so we do not want to miss the prize by being so narrow focused on I have a stream program, a STEM Let's talk about making sure that our future talent workforce for some jobs that we don't even we don't even know don't we don't even know exist yet will have the skills that we can bring this wonderful industry back to our country. So in these last few minutes, I'd like each one of you leave the golden nugget for our audience. And then Jeremy, if you'll chime in, if there's some question or something that we need to get answered, hey, chime in for us. So we'll go around the horn or, or just open mic and let's talk. <clears throat> our time is running short, so be brief for me, please. <laughs> Okay, Jennifer, let's kick it off. Okay, Eden, there we go. Here we go. Let's go. <laughs> okay, let's go. So I, I help lead a consortium of STEM education and outreach partners that's funded by the Department of Defense STEM office. And one of those partners in the San Diego ecosystem has done a lot of mapping of STEM in their communities. And I think that's so important because you can look at the list of STEM opportunities available in a community and the list may be long and you can say, wow, we're doing it. But then when you map it, you may see parts of the community where there is no STEM programming. The list doesn't extend to there. And I think that level of analysis has really allowed them to think deeply about where STEM is and isn't, even within their community, and then address those needs. So I encourage that to be one strategy. Right. Know your resources and know where resources are not. Are, are not. Thank you. Eaton. So my nugget in some ways is more of a challenge that slash question, actually, <laughs> um, leading both and includes Alliance as well as a smart and connected communities project, both of which are really focused on broadening participation and connecting STEM and communities. I think as a community, I want to challenge us and particularly those who are going to be building ecosystems, how are we going to privilege the participatory methods, not traditional research methods, but the participatory methods that we need to include everybody in the community in understanding their systems as they are in order to design them, the new systems from the ground up to account for equity, to account for belonging, to ensure industry is going to schools, not just to show them what's possible, but to actually talk to kids so they 
are seeing innovative ideas that can improve science. That's what I want to know how we are going to stay committed to doing that. You know, I think you just uh, gave us the title for our next webinar. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go back to my original point, which is just that you know, poverty has a huge effect on STEM education. And so you cannot overestimate the importance of um, a really highly functional and balanced STEM ecosystem where all those needs are addressed for students and not just the educational part. Natalie, thank you, Emily. Yeah, I might leave with a comment about emerging technology and sort of flipping the narrative that I think exists with some of these technologies, especially around AI. I think, you know, some of these technologies can be intimidating and I would challenge people to see them as opportunities, both for us to be innovators and, you know, continue to be competitive as a nation, but also opportunities for students to solve really big problems that our world is facing and also the opportunity for jobs. I think to some degree, society has been fed a narrative around how AI can be scary or these types of technologies can really be intimidating for some people. And I would just really challenge people to flip that narrative upside down and really look at the opportunity that it brings to, to all of us today. Natalie, thank you. One request, if you could give us the video of the inside of a Qualcomm facility so people can see the production of chips, that'll be wonderful for the group. Absolutely. Panelists, thank you today for this wonderful conversation. Jeremy, I know we ran over a little bit. Back to you, oh, sir. Good. Thank you. Reginald, panel, I, I really appreciate all of your time. I told you all this was going to go by really fast <laughs> and be chock full. My note page is about uh, six pages long of tiny little chicken scratch. Um, I've learned so much today. We're just about to close this session, but before we do, I'd like to invite Judd Pittman, director of K-16 Initiatives, Thaddeus Stevens College, and chair of the SLECOP Leadership Coordinating Council to share his insights. Judd, you have a unique perspective on the intersection of STEM and government. What were your big takeaways from the STEM ecosystems briefing book and the conversations today? Uh, Jeremy, thanks for uh, a quick moment. I think the, the biggest thing that really came out of the day was the importance of ecosystems to be catalysts for student voice and making sure that we bring students to the table and not just bring them to the table, but ensure that they see their voice as part of the solution. And that we do so with not only students, but caregivers, uh, I really like the conversation around uh, inclusive competitiveness. If we don't have all voices at the table that represent the diversity of this great nation, we're not going to come to the best solution. And I think about Ruth Farmer and an and a example that she gave a couple years ago at a summit in Pennsylvania. And she asked everyone, where does a lady put a pocketbook in her car? And everyone was like, on the floor. Well, that's because females weren't part of that design process when we started to design cars and there isn't a space. And if there was, there would be a space for that pocketbook or bag. So I think that's a really simplistic way to think about why it is so critical that we have a diverse set of voices at the table for these solutions. And I really like where Natalie left us because we need that diversity so that we're not creating systems, whether are automated or artificial intelligence systems that uh, that they drive towards greater division and, and, and less equity when we really want them to drive towards equity. So if ecosystems have that opportunity to really bring and be the catalyst for those types of inclusive competitiveness solutions and making sure that voices are at the table included and we see that in the solution that we create. Uh, the last thing I would say is I love the idea about the data visualization because we do do this laundry list, but sometimes when we see where they are, spatially and where we can find them in communities, there are still communities that are marginalized in those opportunities. And it's always best to put all that data out there because that's the opportunity that we have moving forward. So share the data, tell the story, even if it's good or bad, um, that's the opportunity for us to make a transformative change and ecosystems are positioned to do that. Judd, you and my great grandma Ethel are the only people I've ever heard say pocketbook in real life. Uh, but more importantly, this has been a really long time coming. And we're so pleased to be releasing this report to you today. We're going to go ahead and put that report again in the chat, but you'll be able to find it on the SLECOP website. It'll also be in the follow up communications. Sadie, real quickly, what are our next steps before we close? Yeah. So, as Jan mentioned in our opening, collaboration is key. At this point, 
um, people and ecosystems with like-minded visions should be talking, and we will continue to bring them together to cross-pollinate ideas and scale the proven effective STEM ecosystem solutions. We also need to continue to inform all stakeholders, so we're anticipating briefing Congress, NSF, and other co-STEM agencies. And lastly, we will be providing deep technical assistance, such as grant writing support to STEM ecosystems. Back to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Sadie. Well, this has been really great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to Jan, James, Reginald, Jeff, all of the panelists, and to the incredible team that put this report together, Jan, Alyssa X, and Lauren, Sadie, and I'm sure 12 other people that I've forgotten, and the many voices of our valued partners. Thank you all, and we will see you next time.